And because of that love and that respect they had for me, uh, they named one street after me. Because okay. I took, yeah, and it's called Helmand Drive, which is already there. And uh, just just to uh, appreciate what I did for that country. It must have been an awkward uh, name for a street in about 2007 and eight when uh, Helmand was making all the headlines and all the headlines. <laughs> and back then, nobody knew what Helmand meant anymore. Welcome to the Afghan Eye YouTube channel. If this is your first visit, make sure to subscribe and press the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our new videos. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Afghan Eye podcast. I'm your host, Sangar Baikar. And I'm your co host, Ahmed Walid Kakar. And uh, today, after quite a long uh, hiatus of uh, not having released any podcasts, we're joined by a special guest, uh, Abdul Hamid Hilmandi. Assalamu alaikum, Hilmandi Seb. Alaikum salam. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to be part of your program. Uh, we are delighted to have you as a guest. Uh, first of all, uh, for our uh, uh, viewers and listeners uh, to get to know you, um, you are currently uh, a, a senior advisor of uh, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani in agricultural development. And as I've uh, uh, done some research about you, you're also a board member for Association for renewable energy stakeholders in Afghanistan and the founder of Afghan Wind Solar. And as I just discovered a minute ago, you have planted more than a million uh, pistachio trees across the country. Before we delve uh, into that, uh, maybe you can also tell us something about your background, your education. Uh, I have uh, uh, done my high school in, in Kandahar, Ahmad Shababa High School. Then I went to India uh, and uh, I did my master's degree from Delhi University uh, in 1979, almost 41 years ago. Uh, and and, and my, my, my speciality was in production and quality control. Okay. And uh, you finished your education in 1979. Uh, that's the year when uh, the war started in Afghanistan. So you were a young graduate. Uh, uh, what happened uh, to you? How did your life, uh, how was your life affected by uh, uh, the war in 1979? Uh, I, I have applied for my PhD in American University back then and I got admission. But the Russians uh, took my dad alive, the communist. And uh, since I was the eldest, uh, I had no choice but to come to the country and take care of the, my father's affair and my family. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, then, then my father had a, a raisin processing factory in Kandahar. We were exporting raisins to uh, England and um, in Sri Lanka and Holland. Uh, and, and those were the markets that were established by my dad. So uh, I started continuing that business and, and, and trying to put my family back together with a, such a big shock. Okay. Uh, uh, when you uh, uh, took control of the family business, uh, at that particular time, uh, did you face any uh, particular uh, challenges personally? Because... Uh, uh, obviously, you know, the war has affected many people. Uh, can you tell us something about how uh, you experienced that uh, particular era? It was a terrible era. You know, I was very young and all of a sudden I became father and I became, uh, you know, uh, I had to lead my family and, 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 and see how I can fight uh, those guys which did this zulum to the, to the country. And, by, and then, and while running my factory, uh, the people, uh, the communist people didn't like me. And uh, uh, they almost uh, killed me. And in and, and, and the beginning, I couldn't even sleep in my house. I was sleeping next door. And sometimes, because Kandahar is hot, I used to be on the roof to see if the communists were looking for me so I can run away. So I was all the time, uh, ready to fly 
anytime they want to attack me or anytime they want to uh, arrest me because, you know, I wasn't with them. I was against them. And one time I remember uh, they caught me with some uh, stuff that uh, I was helping the, the fighters, uh, some, some just later. And, uh, and with that, they almost, you know, like they handcapped me. They put me in front of the, the tank. They were almost, almost going to crush me with a tank. Uh, but luckily, and then they, they were trying to kill me, but then some the Russians decided that I shouldn't be killed. I should be taken uh, for interrogation and further questioning uh, that I, because they found uh, my ID card, my student ID card in the university. They thought I was leading some, some, some moments there. So finally, uh, in jail, a friend of my father uh, discover that I'm his son, and then he released me. Uh, and, you know, I went through a lot, you know, I mean, I'm trying to write a book about it. What uh, I went through is like most of the Afghans. We lost a lot of our family. Uh, they took our uncles, they took our cousins. You know, we were the first one that was attacked by, by the government back then. And, and was it because uh, your family had a business and uh, they, uh, the communists, uh, uh, as far as I know, especially uh, in 1979, uh, they uh, had a lot of distrust and animosity towards people who have land, property and business, etc. Was that the reason? That wasn't the only reason. They were really, really looking for people who had some leadership abilities. Since my, body, uh, my father was a, a business leader and, and a community leader, and they were looking for those kind of people that they had the you know, ability to lead, you know. And they were really, uh, they had an order from, I don't know from where, maybe from Moscow, to arrest and, and get rid of those people who has got leadership ability. And that's how they choose anybody that who could speak out, anybody that could, some good, uh, that they could sense that they have followers, they, 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 they thought by killing those leaders, they will have much better control of the country. Okay. So uh, when, uh, when you faced all those challenges uh, eventually, uh, when exactly did you move to the United States? I, I moved back in the United States in 1983, uh, okay. you, know, you know, for three and a half years. I was, you know, going through all that disasters, going those challenges, and a lot of time I always thinking about when I'm going to be dead. You know, I never thought I'm going to uh, live through those conditions. And uh, I remember I used to every evening before I left my office, I used to tell my guys how much people have paid me, how much I should we should be paid to them, because I thought maybe I won't be alive next day. I was just staying day by day, you know. Okay. And, and uh, w once you moved to the United States, uh, what did you do? Uh, you came to the United States as a young man. How was your life like uh, in, the, in those era? Uh, it was a very good experience back then. You know, when I saw U.S. and when I saw Afghanistan, it was like a, a you know, a hell in heaven, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a peaceful country, nice country, you know. Uh, good people, and they really, you know, and and I wanted to continue my business, and I was looking for different kind of businesses to start, and then I discovered at that time the telecom industry was uh, was monopolized by AT and T back then in, in U.S. and some M MCI another company. They questioned them in court. I was why I was following the news that MCI said, "Where do we have monopoly on on, on telecom business?" And finally, uh, uh, the uh, court decided in favor of MCI. They said, yes, anybody can get into that. I said, wow, this is a great opportunity. And it's a new business. So I, I started a telephone company uh, okay. from scratch. And with that telephone company, all of a sudden, you know, with the hard work that I did, I, I established 5,000 customer base, mostly businesses that we were providing uh, quality long-distance services to them uh, and, and I was earning 
good amount of money from that from that business. But my challenge at that business was that collection in U.S. is a big problem. When you supply credit to people, it's 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 very hard to collect the money back. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I got sick and tired. Not only that, because we're a new business. When we went to people and told them that I'm providing a long distance, they thought I was a stranger, a foreigner, a stranger with a new business. Yeah. I thought I was a thief, you know. They wouldn't trust me. So we had a very hard time selling stuff. But luckily, I went through that stage and, and I, uh, my business was successful. But in the meantime, I got burned, you know, because the technology was new. The business was new. Uh, the country was new to me, so I could only survive for three years. And finally, I sold that business, and I got into real estate. I got into real estate development, and uh, I learned how to uh, plan uh, a community, how to uh, build a community, how to build the roads, how to build the, their houses. You know, and I just learned a lot, you know, I learned a lot and I got my license to build from state of California uh, in 19, uh, 1995. I got I got my license, 85, I'm sorry, 85. I got my license as a builder. So I start building and I built a lot of uh, communities and I really turned around really junk areas in California into beautiful housing communities and the mayor and the city were in love with me. And because of that love and that respect they had for me, uh, they named one street after me. Because okay. I took, yeah, and it's called Helmut Drive, which is already there. And uh, just just to uh, appreciate what I did for that country. It must have been an awkward uh, name for a street in about 2007 and eight when uh, Helmand was making all the headlines and all the headlines. <laughs> and back then, nobody knew what Helmut meant, you know. Uh, I know they just thought, I, they didn't know what it meant, but that's what I thought that would be a good thing to leave an Afghan name in, in an American uh, street. So just out of just out of curiosity, from which area of Helmand are you? I'm from. Uh, we are. We have moved. My family moved from Helmand in Ayub Khan's time. My my grandfather. Okay. My 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 grandfather was the uh, second commander after Ayub Khan, who fought the okay. British. And and he was the, the basically uh, the second person and commander, and he had the biggest. Uh, followers that he brought because he was in Alim, he was uh, uh, a leader. So he brought uh, from with Ayub Khan, not that many people came from Herat. So basically, the the people from Helmand was collected under leadership of my grandfather. So they came. What was his uh, out of curiosity? What was your grandfather, your ancestor's name? Because I've done a lot of reading on uh, Ayub Khan. So if I will go and Google it later on. Yeah, Hazrat, Hazrat, we call him Hazrat Nika. He was mm -hmm. a alim and he was a leader. Okay. He a fatwa that, that we have to go and fight the British. And people really respected him for his ilm, for his honesty, for his uh, um, character. And uh, and that's why they followed him. And that's why Ayub, Ayub Khan sent him a letter that get ready. I'm going to re relieve Kandahar from the British. I'm going to take the Kanda back from the British, get prepared. So he uh, brought at that time uh, more than 3,000 people. And, uh, and uh, Hotek, Hotek Saab did write about it. Uh, and he did some investigation, uh, okay. Masum Hotek. And uh, that's how they, uh, my grandfather and Khan met in Grishk. And from Grishk, they started moving to Kandahar. And the British came out of, out of Kandahar and they met them in Helm in my one. And and luckily, you know, they defeated them. They went and re released uh, Kandahar. For, uh, I mean, they declared independence of Kandahar from the British. Okay, so so that at that time your family settled in Kandahar. Yeah, my, because he was a spiritual leader, he didn't yeah. want to in politics, so he still lead his. Uh, he had uh, students, so he started teaching again. And there's a famous uh, masjid in Kandahar. It's called Mui Mubarak. It's, uh, yeah. it's yes. a Mubarak. So he had, uh, that's where he was teaching. 
what he learned and he was he continued his his students were coming and he was teaching there. Next to Moe Mubarak, there was a house that was he bought and then he was basically, uh, you know, leading his uh, uh, his career that he led back in Helmand. 